Hey, boys and girls, it's Mr. Bryant here. Uh, gosh, I really hope you guys are doing well. Um, hopefully, you're using this time, all this time off to, uh, you know, work on yourself, to uh, learn a new language or keep a journal or learn how to write cursive or something. Uh, man, this we are living through some extraordinary times, I tell you. Um, this is going to be something that you tell your kids about. This is something that I'll have to teach about in U.S. history in a couple of years. This is something that uh, it's been a long time since anyone's had to deal with something like this. So. But I've tried a couple of times already to make uh, recordings of some presentations. It hasn't really worked out. I'm hoping that this setup will work using Zoom. Um, seems like the entire world is sold out of webcams. I'm stuck using my laptop's webcam for that. Um, I'm going to put this on YouTube. and Hopefully you guys will, will find this useful. Uh, it'll be just like, you know, once a week in class when we take notes. I'm going to go through a PowerPoint presentation here about Gerald Ford and uh, Jimmy Carter. I'll post some questions to Edsby along with the PowerPoint presentation as well. So you can take a look at that if you need to. Uh, but let's see if this works. Okay. So let's see here. Share screen and away we go. <clears throat> so last week, uh, you guys had learned a little bit about Richard Nixon and the Watergate scandal. And hopefully you guys uh, read through that, came to kind of an understanding of, of just exactly what Nixon was up to you know, covering up all those crimes. Um, you know, it wasn't the burglary so much. It was the cover up afterwards, you know, asking the FBI and the CIA to, to interfere in the investigation, bribing the burglars to go to prison without speaking uh, truth to what had actually happened. You have the Washington Post reporters who were uncovering all the corruption and eventually, you know, Nixon has to resign. There are those, those tapes that he's supposed to hand over. So it's just, you know, a whole mess. Uh, it's why Nixon, you know, even though he had these tremendous foreign policy accomplishments, he's, he's uh, remembered as the only president ever to be forced to resign. Um, but it's a strange thing, you know, so he got Nixon here. And, um, you know, normally a situation like this, the, the vice president becomes the new president. Strange situation, though. Uh, Nixon's vice president, a guy named Spiro Agnew, he was the governor of Maryland before being vice president. He had been forced to resign before Nixon for a totally separate scandal involving bribery when he'd been the governor. Um, so about six months before Nixon resigned because of the Watergate scandal, he had had to choose a new president to replace Spiro Agnew. So he chose uh, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, a Republican named Gerald Ford, right? So Gerald Ford becomes the new vice president. Six months later, Nixon resigns, and now Ford is the new president. So like bingo, bango, all of a sudden, he's like accidentally kind of stumbles backwards into being the president. Um, and, you know, Ford, he's only going to be president for about 18 months, about a year and a half. He's going to run for president himself in 1976, but he's going to lose. Uh, he's not terribly important, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on him. Not a lot of major accomplishments. I'm not even going to go over these. Um, the thing that he's most remembered for, though, is the first thing up on the screen here, is that he pardoned Richard Nixon. This was a very controversial decision. You know, people felt like, gee, Nixon had put the country through this horrible thing, extending the Vietnam War and all this corruption, all this stuff. Um, and Ford pardons him. So Nixon's never going to go to prison. He's never going to face jail time. He's never, there's not going to be any trial uh, to deal with the crimes that he committed. But Ford said, basically, look, we need to move on. That we could do this. We could spend the next two or three years trying to prosecute Nixon. Uh, it may or may not work, but the best thing for the country is just to move on. Very controversial decision at the time. I think as, as time has gone on, people have realized that was probably the best thing to do, is just to kind of move on from Nixon and kind of forget about what he had done. Okay. Um, now, it's, it's kind of unfair for Ford. Uh, he was kind of, a, he was kind of a, an awkward guy. He fell down a lot, fell down some stairs, fell down skiing a lot, so he was photographed doing that. People kind of took him as a bit of a joke. Um, it's during his presidency that Saturday Night Live first first uh, begins uh, airing on TV, and he was played by Chevy Chase, and he was portrayed as a sort of bumbling idiot. Uh, one other fun fact about Gerald Ford, he had back-to-back uh, -back assassination attempts. Uh, two women tried to murder him uh, a week apart from each other, and uh, one of them, the, the woman here uh, on the Time Magazine cover, uh, she tried to kill Ford. She, her name was Squeaky Frome. This squeaky is her name. And she was part of the Marilyn Manson family, right? 
Uh, Marilyn Manson was the, the serial killer. He's the guy with the swastika carved into his forehead, uh, responsible for the horrible uh, Sharon Tate murders back in the late 1960s. But this woman, Squeaky From, was like one of his like followers, and she was visiting him in prison, and he told her to kill Gerald Ford. So she throws on this like red riding hood costume and manages to get within like five feet of Gerald Ford. She has a pistol, points it at his like groin <laughs> and pulls the trigger. Like she got, she got within like, like I said, just a few feet of the president and she had forgot to put a, a, a bullet in the chamber. Didn't load the gun. So it did not go off. So she was tackled. Uh, and then the other woman here, Sarah Jane Moore, uh, just a crazy woman. She had uh, she actually, actually managed to fire the gun uh, from about 40 feet away from Gerald Ford, missed both times. So uh, she was she was taken to the ground. So he survived both of these assassination attempts. As if, anyway, as I said, those are the only interesting things about Gerald Ford. He runs in 1976, but he's going to lose to the Democratic candidate who's pictured here, Jimmy Carter. <clears throat> Uh, who is the governor of Georgia and really kind of came out of nowhere, right? He's, he is this former peanut farmer turned politician, uh, Democratic Party, right? Uh, Nixon and Ford had been Republicans, and so the country was kind of looking to make a change, and so they liked Jimmy Carter. And Jimmy Carter, is he's like the nicest guy you can possibly imagine, right? Big thing about Jimmy Carter, I know a lot of politicians say that they're religious or that they're you know, church going people, but like uh, you take president Trump, for example, you know, he's a Christian and all that, but he doesn't really go to church. Um, most presidents don't uh, George W. Bush did to be fair. He went, went quite often, but Jimmy Carter, man, this guy, he's like a super religious guy. He he's like Sunday school teacher. Um, you know, he's at, he's at the church like two or three times a week. This was someone who like religion for him was like a central tenant of who he was. And so he wanted to govern that way. He wanted to govern sort of along the, um, you know, sort of teachings of the Bible. And so you, you see a lot of human rights um, come to the center of his administration, but just a really, really good person is what Jimmy Carter is. Unfortunately, um, being a good person does not mean you're going to be a good president. And Jimmy Carter is not considered to be a good president. He's going to spend four uh, sort of difficult years in the presidency at a time when the country was still reeling from Watergate. We were still getting over, um, you know, the loss in the Vietnam War. The economy was bad. And Carter's not really going to be able to fix any of that stuff. A um, couple things that, you know, he accomplished here, you can see up on the screen. Uh, amnesty for draft dodgers. So all of those Americans who had uh, tried to dodge the, the Vietnam War draft by fleeing the country to Canada and places like that. First thing he does in office, literally the first day, is he basically pardons all of those people. So they're allowed to come back into the country. Most of them had gone to Canada. Um, still to this day, there's uh, about 10,000 or so of those guys that just never came back. They just felt like, you know, that they didn't want to come back to the U.S., but most of them did. Um, we're going to have an OPEC embargo. OPEC is the oil and petroleum exporting countries of the world. You're going to notice today, I don't know if you guys have been watching in the news about the decline in oil prices. Uh, that's partly because of OPEC today. Um, this deal between Saudi Arabia and Russia, who were both members of OPEC. Um, they've been producing too much oil. And uh, so without the demand, because everyone's quarantined, we can't go out of our out of our houses. No one's going drive, no one's driving to work. No one's flying on airplanes. So demand for oil is way down. That's why gas prices are so low right now. But back in the 1970s, this, this organization, OPEC, placed an embargo on the U.S. They didn't sell us oil. So we didn't have any gasoline, right? So what you see in the 1970s uh, are these long lines to buy gasoline. Uh, and you also see the, the, camp, the, the one big accomplishment, and this will probably be one of the questions that I post on Edsby, the one big thing that Carter is able to do with the Camp David Accords, which I'll go over in just a second. Uh, so moving on here, we see the, the lines for gasoline. Got this guy waiting in line to fill up his lawnmower because there were limits. You could only go buy gas certain days of the week, and this guy's going to get an extra gallon or two into his lawnmower. Um, that's not good, right? Americans waiting in line for gas. Uh, here's Jimmy Carter here. One of the ways that we, he wanted to save gasoline or to conserve it was to reduce the speed limit on federal interstates to 55 miles an hour. That's a big mistake. Well, you don't ask Americans to drive slower, right? It is our God-given right to drive as fast and as dangerously as we possibly can. And then he has this horrible thing, don't be foolish. 
Come on, Jimmy Carter. You're killing me. Okay. Uh, one positive thing of Jimmy Carter's presidency is the Camp David Accords. All right. Um, Israel, this country over in the Middle East that we basically created after World War II in 1948. Um, you know, it's a Jewish state. Uh, all of the Arab countries around Israel had been basically at war with Israel for the entirety of its existence since 1948. So Carter hoped to get Egypt to sign a peace treaty with Israel. And everyone's like, oh, Carter, you're never going to be able to do that because uh, the, the Arabs, they hate the Israelis. But he managed to do it. He got the president of um, Egypt pictured there on the, on, the, uh, on the left of your screen there. That's um, Anwar Sadat and the Prime Minister of Israel, Menachem Begin. He got them to Camp David, which is the sort of presidential vacation house, and he wouldn't let them leave until they signed an agreement, right? Um, and to this day, where, you know, one, of the, one of the big reasons that the U.S. is so friendly with the country of Egypt is because they're the only Arab country in that part of the world that has um, agreed to sign a peace treaty with Israel, okay? But uh, by far, though, the biggest issue that Carter dealt with was this foreign policy problem over in the country of Iran. Okay. And now, you know, Iran's one of those countries that most American or most Americans are like, yeah, we're good with them. I think you don't really know where it is. Don't really care. Right. They sell us oil. Everything's fine. Okay. And that had been our relationship with Iran. We wanted their oil and we had taken steps over the years to make sure that we had access to that oil. Um, so way back in the 1950s, you know, Iran was a, um, it was a British colony. Uh, they had wanted independence from Britain. This is kind of like Vietnam, right? Like the countries that don't get independence, um, they end up, you know, we end up stepping in and pissing everyone off. Um, in the 1950s, the Iranians, they wanted more independence. They wanted more control over their oil. Uh, their leader was a guy, I'll put it up on the screen here is on the left here of your screen is the prime minister named Mohammad Mossadegh. Um, <clears throat> began to take some very anti-American stances, uh, wanted more control of the oil fields, and so we're like, yeah, let's take him out. So CIA comes in, we don't murder him, which is good, but we do remove him from power, and we put in place the guy on the right named uh, Shah Reza Pahlavi, all right? So he's called, just called the Shah. And he was very pro-American. Okay, this is going to be the guy that we are going to make sure, um, you know, keeps access to American oil. Okay, so the Shah is going to be in place in Iran for the next like 25 years from like the 19, you know, early 1950s, all the way up and through the late 1970s. Hopefully the guy mowing the lawn is not drowning out my voice right now, sitting in my backyard. I put on a tie for you guys. I hope you guys appreciate that. Okay. Um. But so the Shah comes in, he's there for 25 years, and we love him. Americans love him. The Iranians, for them, though, did not. They realized that he was a puppet, basically, of the United States. Um, and over the next 25 years, a lot of anti-American sentiment begins to grow in Iran until finally in 1979, there is this revolution, okay, an Islamic revolution. Uh, these hardline fundamentalist, basically crazy people, um, they take over the country. The Shah is kicked out. He flees to the United States, um, where it turns out he's got cancer, so he needs to uh, he needs to get treatment for his cancer, right? And it's at that time when he comes to the U.S. for cancer treatment that the Iranians are like, "Oh hell no, this is messed up." So a bunch of uh, Iranian college students attack the American embassy in the capital city of Iran, uh, the city is Tehran. They attack the American embassy there and they take 52 Americans hostage and they're gonna hold them for 444 days. And this is a horrible situation. You can see a picture of them here. They are tortured, they are beaten, they are, uh, at one point they drag them to the basement of the embassy, tell them they're gonna be executed. They point guns at them and pull the trigger but the guns don't go off, just like psychological torture. Brent, come say hi. Come say hi to my students. All right, get out of here. Um, and so this is the big thing Carter has to deal with, is, is this, these Americans being held hostage for almost a year and a half, and Carter can't get them free. 
right? It's seen as a failure of his presidency. He is seen as a weak president. And it's true. I mean, you know, he, he tried negotiating with the Iranians. He tried a military rescue mission, um, two helicopters carrying Marines flying to Tehran. One of the helicopters crashed. Eight Marines were killed. Okay. Long story short, the hostage, he, Carter could not free the hostages. Um, here's another picture here of uh, one of the hostage takers here, the guy circled on your screen, uh, later on ended up being the president of Iran, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Ahmadinejad. I remember his name because it sounds like I'm a dinner jacket. I wonder if I can, okay, there we go. I'm a dinner jacket. Uh, so when the election of 1980 rolls around, uh, Carter was, you know, he was dead in the water. You can see here up on the map, election 1960, Carter loses uh, a landslide election to the Republican nominee, a guy named Ronald Reagan, who's gonna be a two-term Republican president uh, throughout the most of the 1980s. The day, that Reagan is sworn in, the hostages are released from Tehran. Um, the Iranians really didn't like Jimmy Carter and the second that he was out of office, like literally as Reagan is being sworn in, the Americans are loaded onto an airplane and as soon as he's got his hand on the Bible uh, and Reagan is now the new president and Carter is out, the plane takes off and the hostages are released. So it's a pretty messed up situation. One other really cool thing though, if I go back a couple slides here, uh, down at the bottom here, um, when the embassy was attacked, 52 Americans were taken hostage, but there were six Americans who worked in like the front office of the embassy who were like, who like saw the attack coming and they're like, oh, we need to get the hell out of here. So they duck out of the embassy out into the street. Right? And they're like, what do we do? Where do we go? If, like, if the Iranians know that we are Americans, we are going to be uh, executed as spies. And so like, where can we go? So they, they, uh, they, take a, they get a taxi to the Canadian embassy. Right? And the Canadian ambassador hides these six Americans in his like, personal house for the next six months. And the CIA launches this like, crazy wackadoo rescue mission to get these guys out where they fly in uh, an American CIA agent under the disguise that he is a movie producer and he wants to, f he wants to check out the location in Iran to film a um, science fiction movie, right? He brings in fake Canadian passports to make it look like these Americans are actually Canadians. They go on like a film uh, like scouting mission and then they go to the airport and they use their fake Canadian passports to leave the country. So um, thank you, Canada, for helping those Americans out. Um, there's a great movie about this called Argo. It came out a couple of years ago. Uh, ben Affleck is in it. It's a fantastic film. If you are sitting in quarantine right now and you are looking for a movie to watch, check out Argo. It's A-R-G-O. It's all about the uh, hostage situation in Iran as well as the rescue of these six Americans from the Canadian embassy. It's called Argo. Argo was the name of the fake science fiction movie that they were going to make. It is a fantastic film. Please check it out. So that's going to be it for today, boys and girls. Like I said, you know, we call this the age of limits because the 1970s, it's, it's this sort of depressing time period when America had really kind of lost its mojo. Um, I'm going to put this presentation on the Edsby. There's going to be some questions posted tomorrow for you to answer about it. Hopefully this helped. Hopefully me, you know, watching me go through this a little bit uh, was beneficial in some way. If it wasn't, let me know. If it was, let me know. I hope you guys have a great Thursday. I hope you have a great weekend coming up. Stay safe, stay inside, and uh, next year when we're back at school, come by and say hi. Oh, I should probably stop sharing. Like I said, stay safe. <laughs>